Bible serves as a guide for Christians worldwide and a history book. The Bible has introduced us to many heroes whose legends still resonate loudly today. From the story of David and Goliath to Moses parting the Red Sea, today's Bible remains one of history's best-selling books. However, the Bible also warns of mysterious beings. As the celestial beings continue to inspire worship in the elders, our journey now shifts to explore. Who are these mysterious beings? Are we in any danger? Join us as we explore the 10 most mysterious beings in the Bible that we all should be aware of. The 24 Elders Terrifying Story One of the multitude of beings that the Bible describes and that have intrigued people for years are the 24 Elders. These beings seem to be beyond our understanding and too large for our perception. In heaven, there exists a marvelous throne room, radiant with divine light and brimming with power. This place is extraordinary. It is where the most powerful being in the universe resides. John, the beloved disciple of Jesus, journeyed to the island of Patmos where he had a vision of the book of Revelations. And it was in these visions that he saw the 24 elders. Amidst all the wonders of the spiritual realm stands out one circle, the 24 elders. The 24 elders were dressed in white robes and crowned with crows of gold around the main throne. Who are these figures and why are they here? After addressing the seven churches, John is instantly transported to God's throne room. Here he sees God seated on a throne, decorated with precious stones. Around this throne are 24 other thrones, and on them sit 24 elders. There were four living creatures, and the elders, along with the living creatures around the throne of God, all bowed before God, singing and praising God for being the only one worthy of receiving glory, honor, and power. He created everything for his pleasure, and by him they were created. However, the book of Revelations does not detail the elders' identities. There have been many speculations about their identities. Some have theorized that these elders represent or are representatives of the church, and some believe that they are also angelic beings. However, this theory is very unlikely. We can say that these elders will reign alongside Christ, which is reinforced by their sitting on thrones. It is repeatedly proclaimed that the church rules and reigns with Christ. Also, it is important to note that the Greek word translated to mean elders is never used for angels. It is the term used to describe a group of men who have reached a certain age and can rule, something that angels are incapable of. The term elder cannot be attributed to an angel, although angels can also serve dressed in white. White is a color frequently associated with believers because it is associated with the righteousness of Christ that is accorded to us in salvation. The elders also wear crowns, indicating that they are not angels. No part of the Bible records an angel wearing a crown. The cherubim, the four living creatures, motivate the elders to worship as the cherubim worship God every hour of the day. The elders are seen as representatives of God's people, especially in the Old Testament. As the celestial beings continue to inspire worship in the elders, our journey now shifts to explore the enigmatic presence of the angel of death. The angel of death. We have all heard about angels, but what about the angel of death? We are first introduced to the angel of death through Exodus. The Egyptians refused to release the children of Israel, and God sent them many plagues. But the worst plagues God sent can be seen in Exodus 11, verses 1 and 2. The Lord had told Moses that he would do something in the land of Egypt, and every ear that heard it would tingle. After that, the Pharaoh of Egypt would have no choice but to let the children of Israel go. Moses was even instructed to tell the children of Israel that they were to ask their Egyptian counterparts for gold, silver, etc. Moses, bearing the instruction of God, went and appeared before the Pharaoh and told the Pharaoh that every firstborn in the land of Egypt would die, from the firstborn of the Pharaoh who rules Egypt to the slave child who was born behind the mill. The animals were not left out, as the firstborn of the cattle would not be exempt. In Egypt's past and future, there would be no disaster greater than this. This disaster would cause mourning on a scale never seen before. Egypt was going to be visited that night, and that visit would cause a mass exodus. Every house shall be invaded, and except there be blood at the doorposts of the house, that house shall know mourning. The Israelites believed the word of God through Moses and did as they were told. But the Pharaoh refused to comply, and as a result, exposed not only himself but his people to the wrath of God. 
And as it was midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborns in the land of Egypt, from the child of the Pharaoh to the children of the mages, the slave child, and even the cattle. On that night, a cry like none heard before filled the sky in Egypt, as there was not a house without a dead person. Fulfilling God's word, the angel of death spared no one. Even the king was not spared from the clammy fingers of death and affliction. But because the children of Israel followed God's instructions, they were spared. It is difficult to imagine what sort of despair ruled the night on that fateful day. The children of Israel were finally given permission to leave Egypt. And as the great multitude marched through the streets toward the border, the wails and cries of the mourning Egyptians echoed. The angel of death is another name for the destroying angel. God has different angelic beings for different purposes. Some are sent to deliver judgment to the sinners on earth. However, no clear biblical evidence exists of a designated destroying angel. In Hebrews 11, verse 28, this being is referred to as the destroyer of the firstborn. Accordingly, the original Hebrew text of Exodus 12, verse 23, does not mention an angel. It simply states that the destroyer, the one who causes harm, will inflict damage on the firstborns of Egypt. Psalm 78 describes the plagues in Egypt as the unleashing of the hand of the destroying angels. The Hebrew word for angel used in this text does not refer to a specific angel. Also, God sent a destroying angel once to the Israelites who brought about destruction as a result of the sin of King David. King David numbered the children of Israel after being moved by the devil, who was seeking occasion against the children of Israel. The Lord sent a plague upon Israel and 70,000 people lost their lives. When the angel stretched his hand to Jerusalem, the Lord relented his decision and told the angel who was afflicting the people that it was enough. It was time to withdraw. In his mercy, the Lord opened David's eyes to see the angel standing over Jerusalem with a flaming sword. David proclaimed that he had sinned and offered sacrifice to the Lord. The horrifying Leviathan. The Leviathan is a large aquatic animal. The Bible describes it as a fearsome beast with monstrous ferocity and great power. Leviathan can also be used as an image of the devil, endangering both God's creatures by attempting to eat them and God's creation by threatening it with upheaval in the waters of chaos. As the usual translation for the Leviathan in the Septuagint says, a dragon appears in the book of Revelation. Although the Old Testament does not identify the Leviathan with the devil, the seven-headed dragon in the book of Revelation does. This shifts the battle between God and the primordial chaos monsters to God and the devil. Only once in the book of Job is the Leviathan translated as a sea monster. In the following chapter, a seven-headed beast, described with the same features as the dragon before, rises from the waters, endowing a beast of the earth with power. Dividing the beast into one monster of water and one of dry earth is probably a recall of the monstrous pair, Leviathan and Behemoth. Isaiah 27.1 states that God will slay the dragon on the last day and cast it into the abyss. The destruction of the chaos monster will result in a new world of peace without any trace of evil. Thomas Aquinas described Leviathan as the demon of envy, first in punishing the corresponding sinner. Peter Binsfeld likewise classified Leviathan as the demon of envy and as one of the seven princes of hell corresponding to the seven deadly sins. Leviathan became associated with and may originally have been referred to by the visual motif of the hellmouth a monstrous animal into whose mouth the dam disappeared at the Last Judgment, found in Anglo-Saxon art from about 800 and later all over Europe. The Revised Standard Version of the Bible suggests in a footnote to Job 41 poem, one, that Leviathan may be a name for the crocodile, and in a footnote to Job 41 15, that Behemoth may be a name for the hippopotamus. The Savage Behemoth? The behemoth is one of the few biblical creatures on which the academic community is still trying to reach a consensus. The Hebrew word behemoth is only mentioned once in biblical text, in a speech from the mouth of God in the book of Job. It is an ancient creature created by God and so powerful that only God can overcome it. In the Bible, God is heard talking to Job about the behemoth, asking questions of Job and telling him if he could take the behemoth whom he made as did Job. He eats grass like cattle, his strength is in his loins, his might in the muscles of his belly. He makes his tail stand up like a cedar, and the sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are like tubes of bronze, and his limbs are like iron rods. He is the first of God's works, 
only his maker can draw the sword against him. The mountains yield him to produce, where all the beasts of the field play. He lies down beneath the lotuses in the swamp reeds, sheltered by their shade. The willows of the brook surround him. He can restrain the river from rushing. He is confident the stream will gush at his command. Can his eyes take him? Can hooks pierce his nose? This is answered in the book of Job, chapter 40, verses 15 to 24. The passage later pairs Behemoth with the sea monster Leviathan. Both are composite mythical creatures with enormous strength that humans could not hope to control. Yet both are reduced to the status of divine pets. Seraphim, the evil-minded monster. The book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verse 6, is the only place in the Bible where the seraphim is mentioned. Isaiah describes his intense vision of the heavenly court. In that chapter, Isaiah saw God exalted, seated on his throne and surrounded by flying angels known as seraphim. The seraphim appear like humans, as Isaiah describes them as having faces and voices. Medieval Christian theology places seraphim in the highest choir of the angelic hierarchy. They are the caretakers of God's throne, continuously singing holy, holy, holy. Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite, in his celestial hierarchy, drew upon the book of Isaiah to fix the fiery nature of seraphim in the medieval imagination. In his view, seraphim helped God maintain perfect order and was not limited to chanting the Trisagion. Taking his cue from writings in the rabbinic tradition, the author gave an etymology for the seraphim as those who kindle or make hot. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2, In the year that King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord seated on the throne, and the hem of his garment filled the temple. Above him were the seraphim, each having two wings. With two, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. The angels may appear as burning flames, as the word seraphim comes from the Hebrew verb seraph, which means to burn with fire, or more specifically, to burn. The name might also allude to purification, as it was seraphim who touched the lips of Isaiah with burning coal and purified him. The seraphim repeatedly proclaims God's supreme holiness and glory in Isaiah's vision. The seraphim do not address God directly, but call out to each other in God's presence. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. To be holy means being set apart and considered sacred. This three-time invocation of the word holy to describe God's sacred nature appears only two times in the Bible, and angels speak both times to someone transported in a vision to the throne of God. The other passage containing this threefold invocation of God's holiness is Revelation 4 to 8, which refers to six-winged angels surrounding God's heavenly throne and constantly declaring God's glory. It is probable enough that popular mythology connected fire with the attendance of the deity in various ways among different peoples, and that burning lies at the base of the idea in all these suggested etymologies. It remains, however, that in Isaiah's use there is nothing of the popular legend or superstition. These seraphim are august beings whose forms are not at all fully described. They had faces, feet, hands, and wings. In three pairs, the six wings covered their faces and feet in humility and reverence, and were used to sustain them in their positions around the throne of God. One of them is the agent for burning, with coal off the altar, not with his power or person, the sin from the lips of the prophet. Lucifer, the evil fallen one. The fallen one, the morning star. That great serpent, once one of God's highest ranking angels alongside Michael and Gabriel, is described in the book of Ezekiel as the anointed cherub. In a modern translation from the original Hebrew, the passage in which the phrase Lucifer, or morning star, occurs begins with the statement that on the day the Lord gives you relief from your suffering and turmoil and from the harsh labor forced on you, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon, how the oppressor has come to an end, how his fury has ended. After describing the king's death, the taunt continues. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, which once laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. Those who see you stare at you. 
They ponder your fate and say, is this the man who shook the earth and made kingdoms tremble? The man who made the world a wilderness, overthrew its cities, and would not let his captives go home? The metaphor of the morning star that Isaiah 14, 12 applied to a king of Babylon gave rise to the general use of the Latin word for the morning star, capitalized as the original name of the devil before his fall from grace, linking Isaiah 14, 12 with Luke 10, saying he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven and interpreting the passage in Isaiah as an allegory of Satan's fall from heaven. Considering pride as a major sin peaking in self-deification, Lucifer became the template for the devil. As a result, Lucifer was identified with the devil in Christianity and Christian popular literature, as in Dante Alighieri's Inferno, Joost van den Vondel's Lucifer, and John Milton's Paradise Lost. Early medieval Christianity fairly distinguished between Lucifer and Satan. While Lucifer, as the devil, is fixated on hell, Satan executes the desires of Lucifer. Cherubim, the protector of paradise, the cherubims were the first celestial beings created by God and the first in the angelic hierarchy to appear in the Bible. When man fell in the garden and God banished him from the garden, God used the cherubims to guard the tree of life with a flaming sword. According to the biblical description of the cherubim, their jobs are to declare man's sinfulness before God and to protect God's presence from sinful men. In medieval theology, following the writings of Pseudo-Dionysius, the cherubim is the second highest rank in the angelic hierarchy, following the seraphim. In traditional Christian angelology, cherubim are regarded as angels of the second highest order of the ninefold celestial hierarchy. De Celesti Hierarchia lists them alongside seraphim and thrones. According to Thomas Aquinas, the cherubim are characterized by knowledge, unlike the seraphim who are characterized by their burning love for God. In Western art, Cherubim became associated with the Pudo and the Greco-Roman god Cupid Eros, with depictions as small, plump, winged boys. Artistic representations of cherubim in early Christian and Byzantine art sometimes diverge from scriptural descriptions. The earliest known depiction of the tetramorph cherubim is the 5th to 6th century apse mosaic in the Thessalonian church of Hoseos David. This mosaic is an amalgamation of Ezekiel's visions in Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 15 to 28, Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 12, Isaiah's seraphim in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 13, and the six-winged creatures of Revelation from Revelation chapter 4, verse 2. In rabbinic literature, the two cherubim, a boy and a girl, are described as human-like figures with wings placed on opposite ends of the mercy seat in the inner sanctum of God's house. According to 1 Kings chapter 6, Solomon's temple was decorated with cherubs, and Ahab bar Yaakov also claimed this was true of the second temple. The most evil and mysterious high priest, Melchizedek. Perhaps there is no man more mysterious in the Bible than Melchizedek. When we are first introduced to him, it is during the time of Abraham. He makes a quiet entry into the scripture canon. The association of Melchizedek with the Messiah predates Christianity, which developed in Jewish messianism during the second temple period. A collection of early Gnostic scripts dating from or before the 4th century, discovered in 1945 and known as the Nag Hammadi Library, contains a tract about Melchizedek. Here it is proposed that Melchizedek is Jesus Christ. From a Gnostic perspective, Melchizedek, like Jesus Christ, lives, preaches, dies, and resurrects. The coming of the Son of God, Melchizedek, speaks of his return to bring peace, supported by God, and his being a priest king who dispenses justice. The author of the epistle to the Hebrews makes the association with Christ explicit, whereas Melchizedek, the king of righteousness and peace, is explicitly associated with the eternal priesthood of the Son of God. The Christological interpretation of this Old Testament character as a prefiguration or prototype of Christ has varied between Christian denominations. The Pelagians saw Melchizedek as merely a man who lived a perfect life. The typological association of Jesus Christ with Old Testament characters frequently occurs in the New Testament and later Christian writings. Thus, Jesus Christ is associated with Adam and Abraham. Church fathers, including Clement of Alexandria, have interpreted Melchizedek's bread and wine offering as a prefiguration of the Eucharist. Melchizedek, the king of Salem and the high priest of the Most High God, was the first to receive a tenth of everything. Terrifying mysterious creatures surrounding the one. In the New Testament book of Revelation, chapter four, verses six to eight, 
John sees four living beings in his vision. These appear as a lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle, much like Ezekiel's four living creatures, but in a different order. They have six wings, whereas Ezekiel's four creatures are described as having four. In verse 6, they are said to have eyes all over, front and back, suggesting that they are alert and knowledgeable and that nothing escapes their notice. The description parallels the wheels beside the living creatures in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 18 and chapter 10, verse 12, which are said to be full of eyes all around. The Hebrew word for wheel was also used in later Jewish literature to indicate a member of the angelic orders and is also defined by Strong's Concordance to the King James Version of the Biblical Scriptures as a whirlwind, heaven, or rolling thing. In this passage in Revelation, the four beasts surround the one on the red throne, which is of ruby and sardius. The Ophanim, the guardians of God's throne. The most mysterious angel in the Bible is the Ophanim. The term Ophanim in Hebrews refers to wheels. In 597 BC, Jehoiachin, king of Judah, a priest named Ezekiel, and 10,000 Jews were captured by invading Babylonians and brought to a village called Tel Aviv. Five years into their exile, God approaches Ezekiel near a river in Sheba and inaugurates him for prophetic ministry by showing him an extraordinary vision. The Ophanim described in Ezekiel's vision are impossible to define apart from the full scope of the revelation. In Ezekiel 1, we find a young priest on the precipice of his new calling. As part of God's great plan to call Israel to repentance, he opens the heavens before Ezekiel's temporal eyes. Ezekiel sees an ominous, fiery lightning cloud waft toward him from the north. Four illuminated beings blaze brightly within the cloud. Although the beings resemble the form of a man, they are far from mortal. Each has four faces, one human, one lion, one ox, and one eagle. They're completely covered with eyes from the top of their heads to the tips of their glowing calf-like feet. Their human-shaped hands tuck inside each of their four wings. One set of wings stretches outward to connect with the wings of their counterparts, while the other set shrouds their bodies. The prophet doesn't record these creatures by name in Ezekiel chapter 1, where recounting his vision begins. But by chapter 10, they're identified as cherubim. These angelic creatures are associated with the Ark of the Covenant images and the angels most frequently cited in the Hebrew Bible. They're known as the guardians of God's throne, which makes sense when we witness what comes next in Ezekiel's vision. These luminescent interlocking wheels have come to be known as Ophanim, after the ancient Hebrew word meaning wheels. The four Ophanim, guided by the same spirit as the cherubim in one symbiotic entity, are considered the chariot of God's throne. As Ezekiel's vision progresses, the reason for this designation comes to light. Spread above the heads of the four cherubim and the ophanim, Ezekiel sees a breathtaking crystal vault. The only human word he can muster to describe it is awesome. Above the vault, he sees a vibrant, sparkling throne, and high above the throne, he sees the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When Ezekiel witnesses the majesty of God's glory, he immediately falls face down and hears the booming voice of the Almighty, instructing him in his mission to bring God's judgment to rebellious Israel. The Bible never references the Ophanim as angelic beings, but Jewish apocalyptic writers branded them as a class of angels and listed them in their hierarchy of angels, along with the seraphim and cherubim, because of the Ophanim's unique lifelikeness, their supernatural power, and their proximity to God's throne not to mention the multitude of eyes. Ophanim is still mentioned in traditional Jewish prayers sung by congregations as part of their Shabbat morning service. The Ophanim and the holy living creatures raise themselves with great uproar. Facing the seraphim, they offer praise saying, blessed be God's glory from his place. In form and function, the Ophanim in Ezekiel's vision reveals God's supreme reign over the universe. The multi-directional wheels remind us that we serve an omnipresent God who is able to be in all places at all times. As the Spirit of God guides the cherubim, that spirit indwells the Ophanim. When the creatures moved, they also moved. When the creatures stood still, they also stood still. And when the creatures rose from the ground, the wheels rose along with them because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. This symbolic unity of submission displays God's supreme authority and right to rule and reign.
his omnipotence. Thank you for watching. Comment to share what you think in the comment section below. Remember to like and subscribe to see more videos.